pray. All of us. God in heaven, thank you for this Thank you for your love, to protect us in this pandemic. We thank you for you have never now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Good good to see your faces smiling. Means everything is fine. Thank God for everything. <laughs> despite despite the happenings, despite the pandemic, despite the troubles around, we are still smiling because God is on our side. Hey. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, I'm Oh yes. It's good, it's good to be here. It's good to see you once again and um, to be in class with you this evening. So, um, as you know, next week is going to be the end of this term. So next week class, you're going to do, I'm going to give you an assignment for next week. Then the three assignments together would be for to make up your final mark for the, for the term. So we're going to have a class next week. The class next week is going to be a summary of, uh, the, of the three epistles, first, second, and third John. Meanwhile, okay. today, today, I'm going to take us through an through third John. You know, we've discussed first John, we've talked, discussed second John last week. Today we're going to discuss third John. Then next week we'll bring the three together and just go through and summarize the, the whole the three uh, pieces together. Is that okay? All right. Um, again, as we start this, now third John is, uh, is, is, is a very small, very small, in fact, one of the smallest or the shortest um, books of the New Testament, but has a lot of things that are unique, a lot of lessons that are very important for us, for the church of today, and uh, for individual Christians, because it's a very short, short letter, but uh, has a lot of things that we could learn. So I'm sure, I hope that you have one or two things to learn from this letter that will be helpful to our personal lives, or be helpful for the church, or be helpful for society. Because this, this letter actually addresses issues like that. So, now, Third John is unique in the canon of scripture, as it is the shortest book in the New Testament. It is just one line shorter than the second epistle of John, according to the Greek uh, original language. Yet, no other book in the New Testament paints us a more vivid picture of first century early church than that John does. Even though it is a very small letter, very small, very short, but um, it's a letter that actually gives a dis- good description of the early, the, the early church, the kind of lifestyle that uh, we experience or we read about, about, uh, uh, about the early church. So you, re- you can recall sometimes that we make reference to early church because of how in Acts chapter two, when we read about how they were together in unity, they prayed for one another and some of them, none of them lack anything because even those who had lands sold them and brought the money to the apostles so they could share to everyone to the point that no one of them was poor. None of them was hungry. None of them lacked, sorry, lacked anything because they all took care of themselves. That's why sometimes we often make reference to say, well, we need to have a church today that will be like the early church. So the third letter of Epistle, uh, third letter of John, this third epistle actually gives us a very clear picture, a clear picture about the life, about the nature of life in the early church. So quickly, we will go through that and see what this actually entails as we journey through um, this short letter. But before we actually 
put deep into it. <clears throat> there is a significant difference amidst all the similarities between second and third job. <clears throat> there is a, a, a significant difference. You know, these two letters, if you read them together, they seem to have a lot of similarities, second John and third John. Yet, there, is, there are some kinds of uh, differences, which I will point one to you right now. Like the second letter, second John, John the Elder, who addressed to an elect lady. We discussed this in, with you uh, last week, for those of you who were in class, to an elect lady. And we discussed that in length. With the notes I gave you, you read more about what other people, scholars, have said about this elect lady. But at least we were able to establish the fact that this was a letter written to a group of Christians probably meeting in a particular house or given to a particular unnamed woman and all of that. So this we, we talked about some of these things last week. But despite this uh, difference, this is one of the, uh, the similarities. This is one of the differences. Elect lady, the second, that's the second epistle of John. John was writing to her, warning her that she should not admit false teachers into her home, which effectively was admitting them into the church fellowship. So she was one, she was giving a critique whereby, where she, whereby she might know whether a teacher was true or false. I think for those of you who were in class last year, this was some of the things we talked about. This elect lady, John wrote this letter to her, addressing her about, warning her about uh, false teachers and telling her on how to detect them, how to identify these false teachers, and then giving her the, uh, the prerequisites on how to protect herself from being affected by these false teachers. Because one thing, you discover them. The second thing, you know how to interact with them so that you don't fall victim of their false teaching. So this is because uh, John knew that when if these people infiltrate the home where this lady was, then the church will be affected. So that last week I said, that's why we have to be very careful because when our homes are infected with sin, with evil, with false teaching, it has a way of affecting the church. So that's why we have to be very careful to guard our homes against influx, against false teachers, guard ourselves from people who teach things that are different from what the Bible says. So that by that, doing that, we are protecting ourselves from these false teachers, uh, teachers and their teachings. And at the same time, we are protecting the body of Christ from these false teaching and false teachers. And then in the long run, when the church is united, when the church is, is taught and, stood and stands on the truth, we have a chance of influencing the nation. We talked about that last week. So it's very important when John wrote this second epistle to these people, warning this lady about this false teacher. So, but how about third John? Now, third John is like a mirror image of second John in that it is opposite in the sense that John is writing to a man called Gaius. And Gaius is being commended for the very fact that he has admitted teachers into the Church of Jesus Christ where he resided. Rather than a prohibition given by the apostle, apostle to Gaius, there is in fact a commendation and a warning that we should never refuse admittance to those who are the true teachers and preachers in the church. So that's a difference. We talk of the person, the, uh, the person whom John addressed this epistle to. Of course, this is the man called Gaius. Are you getting that? Gaius. A man called Gaius. So this man, uh, if we read from Third John, this is one of, uh, there are a lot of Gaius mentioned in the Bible, but this, so we, don't, there are, uh, we have one of them written in, in the book of Acts of 19, I think, and yeah, and the one talked about in the book of Ephesians, but this is actually a different Gaius. So this Gaius was not, he was not either a preacher, or, uh, he was not a priest or an apostle or anything. He was just a leader in the church. He was just a, a, stand, a leader who stood, a leader who was outstanding with virtues and qualities, with who stood in the truth, who understood the truth that, uh, that we are talking about. And you know, when we talk about truth here, yeah, I have to remind you that 
In second epistle, we talk of this truth as not just a concept, but truth as a person. Jesus, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when we talk about this truth, we are talking about, we are not just talking about an idea, but we are also referring to a, a person, that is God himself. So John wrote this letter to Gaius, who stood on the truth and who acknowledged the truth and who lived by the truth. And this was the same Gaius who opened his home to welcome teachers of the gospel. He opened his house, he opened his heart to welcome people who were true teachers of the gospel. And he treated them well, according to what, uh, what, what, what you read from the Gospel of John, uh, God, the, the Epistle of John, this third epistle. He treated them in such a way that John commended his efforts. So if we look at that from the text, from the Bible actually, Hello, Kaipas. In Third John verse, you are so faithful in the world for your fellow Christians, even when they're about your love. Please help them. Would they sit out on their trip? Oh, uh, no, 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 no problem. Just the oh. network, uh, a little bit network problem. So now it's, it's oh, all okay. right. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So as I, I'm talking about how John described, how John addressed these guys you are talking about. He said, look at, if you have your Bible, you check that in 1 John verse 5. Verse 5. My dear friends, John said, you are faithful in the work you do for your fellow Christians, even when they are strangers. This is someone who had been good to people who are fellow workers of the truth, even though he never knew them, even though they were strangers. But this is different from some people and some of us today who feel that you only do good to people whom you know. Or you only do good to people who come from your place. Or you only do good to people who think like you are, even when they are Christians. But guy used to be something different, that Paul, uh, John commended his efforts. He said, you've been doing so well, you're faithful, you've been so truthful in what you do by being good to fellow Christians, even when you, didn't, you don't know them, even when they are strangers. Because these people have spoken well of you, of you uh, uh, and about what you do. So this is, a, this is something very commendable about the person of Gaius that John is talking about here. So uh, that, that is, that is the, uh, the person whom uh, John actually wrote this letter, actually addressing. It's not, it's, it's not just like, again, this is not also like a, past, a, a kind of letter like the book, like letters like the book of Ephesians and Galatians and others. This is not like that also. But this one was addressed, unlike second, uh, just like second epistle, this one was addressed to a particular person named Gaius. So that is the point I'm establishing here. And why? Because Gaius had proven to be someone above reproach, someone with, who lived a life with difference, amidst a people who chose to do something different. We'll see letters from uh, one other person who did something that was different from what Gaius did, even though he also belongs to the church. We'll see that in a moment. So, but Gaius had a good recommendation because of what he, uh, he did to the people. So, if you like, these two, these two epistles give us two sides of love. In Second John, we have the firmness of love, the lo that love does not open its doors to everything and every thought. If you recall last week, we talk about truth and love. Well, John actually showed that he loved these people by telling them the exact thing to do. And I, I told you last week that you have to be very careful. It's not just about love when sometimes there are certain things um, we feel we don't want to tell people because they might hurt them. Even if it means hurting people, if it is the right thing to do, it's actually loving 
to tell people something that will hurt them, if it's actually loving, tell them in love, if it's something that is coming to harm them. Like John did, he told these people, accommodating strangers, accommodating ministers or, or teachers of the gospel is good. But he told the lady in second episode that be careful. And this is how you know whether they are true teachers or they are false teachers. So he told them that if you see them doing this and that, then you know that these are false teachers. But in this case, Gaius accommodated this one, the true teachers, whom other members of the church were, sent, were, were, were sending away. Other members of the church didn't accept, but Gaius accepted them. So that is the kind of difference that we, we are able to depict from these two letters. So in second epistle, it shows us that love does not open its doors to everything and every thought. How about that? Love does, love does not open its doors to everything and to every thought. So if we, we talk of love, we talk of a guiding language. It guides us into all righteousness. It guides us into doing things, into thinking and as, uh, discerning of what is healthy and what is godly. What God is so, and then there has, there has to be, and then uh, love, as talked about in that John, we have, is love that those who are truly in Christ, those who are in fellowship of the gospel, ought to be given admittance, hospitality among the people of God. That is the kind of, <clears throat> that's the kind of love we, we, uh, John is talking about in Father Christian, that those who belong to Christ, deserve to be given hospitality, they deserve to be given love, those who belong to the family of Christ. But like John said in Second Epistle, so, so you don't confuse, even though, even when these people are ministers of the gospel, we have to be very careful and very wise. Because like we saw last week in Second Epistle, there are things these people could do which would qualify them as false teachers. But if those things are not found in them, you know, these are people you have, you, uh, John is encouraging in third epistle to, uh, to open your arms to them, open your homes to them, and welcome them. And that is exactly what Gaius did. So, but Gaius didn't just open his home to, to welcome these people. Firstly, he opened his heart. He, opened his, he welcomed them from his heart first, you know, before he was able to welcome them into his home. Because because he had shown the agreement that the, whole, the Spirit of God that was in him and was in them had a kind of agreement that would, from his heart, he felt the peace of God and he felt the motivation, he felt um, every reason why he, he ought to do this. And of course, the Spirit pricked him to know that this is being hospitable or hospitality is an act, is something that is highly commendable. Because there are so many stories, so many examples of hospitality that Jesus even said, be hospitable. Because by doing that, some people have welcomed the, uh, angels unknowingly. And some people have sent away angels unknowingly for not being hospitable. So you have to be hospitable, especially to those who belong to the family of Christ, to those who belong, who, who have the same faith line with you, those who have that kind of understanding that, uh, that, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus came, suffered, and died, unlike those false teachers we saw in the uh, in first epistle who denied the humanity of Christ. But having people who have the mind, the mind of who understand that Jesus came in the human form and he lived amongst people, he, he died, was buried, resurrected, and is coming again. So anyone who has this belief, this is someone who, who we have, we, we, need, we are called to like kind of have a connection with them, be hospitable to them, welcome them, and show them love, the love of Christ. And that is exactly what uh, Gaius did here as we see through. So Gaius actually is one of the key characters. It's one of the key characters in, the, in this small epistle. Then there is another character. Let's, let me talk about another character briefly. That is the man called Diotrephes. 
Diotrephus is another character we see. You, if you have your Bibles, you check that in uh, 3 John verse 9. 3 John verse 9. That's another character we find, another person we find in, in this uh, short epistle. And this is what John said. I wrote a short letter to the church, but Diotrephus, who likes to be their leader, will not pay any attention to what I say. When I come, then I will bring up everything he has done, the terrible things he says about us and the lies he tells. But that is not enough for him. He will not receive the Christian brothers when they come and even though stops those who want to receive them and tries to, give, to drive them out of the church. What a terrible person. This is someone who is among the church leaders. This is someone who is in the church. This is someone who claimed to be the, uh, a Christian as well, a Christian leader. Of course, the, John the Apostle said, described him as a leader in the church. But let me, before I go into that, you know, if we want to bring that uh, to bring that to our contemporary times, we have people in churches today who claim to be leaders who will tell you that well. Unless what we agree or what we say, then we cannot do anything in the church. We have people like that in church who will not support anything truth, only support people that think ideas that are their own, even when those ideas are wrong. But they will insist and tell you we are leaders, we are we are the owners of this church, or we are the we, we are the people who started this church and all of those things. We have people like that that we still battle with, that we still struggle with in the church today. So this man, Diotrephus, John said, well, John wrote, first wrote a letter to the church. But Diotrephus likes to be their leader. Of course, he wants, to be every, he wants to be the authority that everything that comes to church, you know, has to come through him. Just like we have today. Even, sometimes today, even the pastors themselves, who feel, well, there is nothing that would ever happen. Some people think God cannot use another person except them. So they feel... Any, you cannot exhibit anything, even if it is your spiritual gift, the few you cannot exhibit that, only then. So these are the likes of the atrophies that John is actually talking about here. So because he likes to be the leader, John said, they wrote, he wrote a letter to them, but he will not pay attention to what John said in the letter. The atrophies will not, because he was a leader, he will not pay attention. He felt what John was saying was just rubbish. So John is, He's saying, and the, the, the worst of it is, he didn't even, he did not only stop that letter, but even those who want to accept what John was saying, he tried to stop them. What a terrible person, eh? So we, we, we read about those kind of people in the book of, um, in the book of Romans, in the book of Romans chapter 2. When Joe Paul was talking to the, to the Jews, he said, there are people who do evil. They don't only do evil, but they support those who do evil as well. They know that what these people are doing is wrong, but they, but they support them to do evil. That is why Joe, uh, Paul said in Romans that because of this, God gave them over to do what they want to do, since that's what they've chosen to do. So, like Diotrephus here, they sent a letter, sent a message to the church, but he wouldn't accept the message. And he tries to stop those who want to accept that message. He wouldn't welcome brethren in church. And he moves to stop those who want to welcome these brethren into the church. He wouldn't accommodate all these ministers, all these preachers and the teachers of the, of the gospel. And he moves, to, he moves to, to stop those who want to do the same thing. So for him, he's, he was the kind of person that if I don't get it, nobody else will get it. That's a very dangerous and a very terrible kind of a person. He feels he, everybody can only take what he approves. Everyone can only receive what he says, uh, what, what, he, what, what, what he affirms. But anything he doesn't like, whether it is good or bad, for him, he feels everybody else should not get that. We have a lot of people like that today, and even in church, that are so toxic to the point that they don't want to see anything good happening to anyone. Anything good coming your way, they feel 
you don't deserve it. They feel they want to switch it off. They, they feel it has to come through them because they feel they are leaders. They feel they have authority. They feel they are ahead of you. So they don't like anything good coming to, coming your way. There are people like that. So what do we need to do? How to be uh, like John said to the second uh, to, to the, uh, in his letter to the second, uh, second epistle of John. He said you have to be you have to discern to understand this kind of people. And you understand their, their, their motives, understand what, why they do what they do. Then you develop a sensitivity on how to respond to them, how to live with them, so that you will not allow them to lead you astray. So that you don't allow them to drag you into their midst. So but that has to do with you reasoning and understanding. And one of the best, one of the ways to get that is for you to get hold of your Bible read through the bible and understand the truth what god says the truth that god is saying in the bible so that when someone else saying something something contrary to what the bible says you don't need an, uh, you don't need someone else to tell you because you would already remind yourself that of course you know what is the truth so no one else will tell you something that is the truth so that was kind of person the difference he is he will not receive the christian brothers when they come and, what, and even stops those who want to receive them and tries to drive them out of the church. These are people that claim that the church is our own. They, they think they have the authority to, 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 to send someone out of church because you are doing something they don't want. It's not, about, it's not about what God doesn't want, but about what they don't want. So they, they can frustrate your life to the point that they want, they, they'll even send to drive you out of church because you are living. You are doing. You are living a kind of life, or you are doing what they don't approve. Even when the Bible approves what you are doing, but because they feel they want to gain authority. Because the reason why you find people who do this is that there are people who want to gain authority. There are people who want recognition. There are people who feel they don't want to lose relevance. There are people who feel uh, they want to always be in control of everything they do. So any, when there is any move to like make them lose some of this control, they feel they don't want to get that. They feel nothing, no one should like come in between to stop them from benefiting from what they have been benefiting. So compare this person with Gaius, who openly welcomed this brethren, who openly welcomed this Christian that John commended. So the difference here, John commended Gaius for the good work he did. But look, listen to what John said to Deuteronomy in verse 10. He said, when I come, then I will bring up everything he has done. The terrible things he says about us and the lies he tells about us. So he has done some very terrible things and he has even gone ahead to poison the heart of the people against John, telling lies telling lies about John and about the other Christians so that they will not also accept them. So John is saying, I understand. I know what he does. I know what he has been saying. But when I, when I come, I'm going to bring up everything he has done. The, all the terrible things, I'll bring them up. But for Gaius, John praised Gaius and even prayed for him. So what do you think? There's something here I want, I want to just mention for, uh, to us. Remember, <clears throat> Uh, Deuteronomy forcefully stopped anyone who, who were sympathetic to the Apostle John and his brethren, anyone who gave fellowship and communion to them within the assembly, they were under the threat of excommunication. But what he says was, anyone who sides with these men coming from the Apostle John can get out of the church. That was how terrible, and that's, that, was, um, that, that, that was what, uh, if you have people in church like that, who and who who listen to things like that and are not strong in the faith, you know, they, 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 they stand a chance of falling away. But remember, understand that Gaius was in that church. But despite the threats, despite all this, what the Jesus was saying, Gaius was unshakable. Gaius stood his ground and went ahead to welcome these people. He went ahead to open his home and was hospitable to God's people. 
That was a contrast. So John was writing to Gaius now saying, well, it seems in this place, not all people are evil. Not all the people in this church are bad. There are people who are standing for the truth. Despite the trouble, despite the persecution, despite the threats, there are people who are standing. So that if you have people who are fellow workers, fellow workers who understand, who, who have the same mindset with you, whom who ha have the kind of, a kind of a similar understanding with you about the things of God, then you have a good support system. That when you are moving, you have people who are moving with you that will encourage you, that will motivate you, that will support what you're doing. So John was happy that Gaius was there, that Gaius was there who is also standing for the truth, who is also standing irrespective of what Beatrice and other people uh, are saying and all saying to other Christians. So he stood his ground and, and John was pleased, John was happy with what um, the position that Gaius took. So the, there are a few things they said mentioned about Gaius here, which are very important. I want to just highlight some. Now, Gaius is one of the four characters, just like I said earlier. He is the man, uh, uh, he is a hospitable character, a friend to the workers in the gospel, and he is a spiritual man. Did you hear that? A hospitable character, that is someone who welcomes, openly welcomes people into his home, and he's a friend to the workers of the gospel, and he's a spiritual man. That was such a good, a good commendation about someone. He's a hospitable person, he is a friend of God's people, and he, <coughs> excuse me, And he is a spiritual man. So these are things said about Gaius. A friend. Let me just mean highlight one thing. Out of it. A friend to God's servants. That is someone, something that is almost a contrast that we find in our society today, in our churches. That's why you, I think that's one of the reasons why you find so many churches around. That so a fellow worker of the of the gospel of Christ sees another person not as a friend, not as a colleague of the gospel of Christ, but sees them as an enemy. These are things we find most in churches today. That's why every day you see people breaking from one church to the other. You see church, everyone will like start building churches, going to start another church because there is enmity. There is a kind of competition that everyone wants to be the boss of himself. Everyone wants to be the leader of himself. Nobody wants to see the progress of another person. But Gaius here, Gaius was a spiritual man. Gaius was a hospitable man. And Gaius was in, showed love for those who were fellow workers of the gospel. That is something very important to take from Gaius' uh, kind of a person. Because understanding that... <clears throat> Would help us to, under, uh, to to reclaim our identity, to, under, to to reclaim our position of what we ought to do. It's not enough. It's not enough to carry Bible along. It's not enough to cut to to cut to to men to cut scriptures everywhere, anytime. It's not enough. But it's good. It's not enough to to sleep in the church every day. It's good, but it's not enough. But what is needful is to put these things into practice. Know what, what James said. He said, faith without works is dead. So, Gaius here wasn't just a spiritual person. He was a spiritual person, but he demonstrated his spirituality by, with, with practice. Firstly, with love. Showing love to other brethren. And secondly, show, ex expressing love by accommodating people who were of uh, servants of God. Remember Jesus said something. He said, when whatever you do for anyone because they know because of my name or in my name, you will be blessed and God will not forget you. You will be rewarded for that. Even to the point that Jesus said, even if it means you give someone a cup of water, a cup of water because of the name of the Lord that singular act would not be forgotten. 
you will be rewarded for that. So how do we respond to this? John, uh, in the book of James, when James talked about faith without works is dead, he said, it's not faith when you say to someone, someone coming to you asking for help or assistance and you have that thing to help this person, instead of you to help them, or give it to them, you tell them, oh, go, may God, uh, it will be well with you. That is a dead faith. That's the kind of faith that James called a dead, dead faith. But faith should be accomplished as we accompany it with action. And that is exactly what we are seeing in Gaius here. Like Deutiphus, Deutiphus actually was a person of, was a religious person, a member of the church, a leader of the church, but his faith was not in, uh, was, was not together with his lifestyle. Okay. Remember what uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians? He says, even if you have the, if you speak in tongues, even if you have the gift of prophecy, if, even if you understand all mysteries, but if you have no love, you are just like a clanging cymbal. You are just like a, an empty drum. Because love is everything. When you love someone, then you can go ahead to do whatever God is expected to, you to do with them. But how would you love someone? You have to love God first. Loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. By loving God, you are able to love those people who God has entrusted into your hands to love. So then briefly, there's another person that, um, that is worth mentioning in this uh, small letter. That is the person we find in verse 12. If you have your Bibles or maybe you want to write that down, Everyone speaks well of Demetrius. Demetrius was another person. Truth itself speaks well of him. And we add our testimony and we know that what we say is true. That's another person, Demetrius. So we talk of John, who actually wrote the letter himself and then addressing the letter to Gaius, commending Gaius and uh, appreciating Gaius and encouraging him to keep on with what he has been doing because the reports of what Gaius is doing is being told by people around. Then the third person is uh, Beatrice, who was, an, who was in the church but was an enemy of the people of God, was an enemy of the gospel teachers. And Paul, uh, jo sorry, John warned against what is going to come after him. And this is the fourth person now who is uh, Demetrius. Demetrius was also a very... A, a, a true a fellow worker who was who John described as a fellow worker for of the truth, because he says even truth itself testifies about this person. Remember, I've been telling you about truth. This truth we talked about in the Gospel of John is not just a concept. Remember that, but we are talking about God Himself. Even truth itself, the Bible says, has given testimony about has. Uh, giving testimony about this about uh, the person of uh, Demetrius and his the good things he is doing, the love he has shown to the brethren, the care he has shown to people or uh, this gospel teacher, preachers and teachers, unlike the uh, uh, So these are the four characters we have, and these four characters, each of them exhibit a different thing. And these people. These characters actually show us or teach us a kind of the diversity we have in church. We have people of these diverse characters. We have people who are in church today who are like who are like guys. We have people who are like Demetrius. We have people who are like Beatrice. So the question we also ought to ask yourself with this is: among these three characters, which what kind of which of the characters do you represent? Either in your place of work either in your home or either in church. Are you like Gaius who, who, who welcomes people into his home, but not only welcoming them into, into his home, but welcomes them from his heart? By welcoming them from his heart, it means you are open to accept people. You don't send people away because of something they've done that you think you don't, you as a person doesn't like or that kind of but you open your heart to loving people, to correcting them in love and righteousness when they've gone wrong, and caring for them. That is when you open your heart to them. And I have told you sometimes in class that 
We have so many people moving around. All they need is something as simple as someone to listen to their problem. Someone to listen to them. They want to speak what is wrong with them. They want to tell someone their stories. But because no one cares. So people moving around in society, in our society with so many problems, they don't need your money. They don't need anything from you. Just give them a listening ear and listen to what they have to say. That is, by listening to what they say, they, it, it has a way of, you have one or two words that God could put in your mouth to tell this person that would build them up, that would encourage them, and that would keep them going. This is the kind of character that guy is portrayed in this, uh, this episode. Too. But also there are people who are like uh, deer traffickers, who see nothing good in the servants of God. They see nothing good in the pastors. They see nothing good in the teachers. They see nothing good in any other person else unless themselves. So if you are not in their camp, if you are not in their party, if you are not in their line of thinking, then forget it. There's nothing, if you wish you sink like an angel, you're only making noise to them. If you wish you can preach like Peter or like or teach like Paul, for them, since you are not doing dancing to their tune, then you are doing nothing. If you wish you can pray like, pray more than Daniel, pray more than all the prayer, prayer warriors you have in the Bible, provided you don't do what they like, they want you to do, then you are doing nothing. These are the dear treasures in, 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 uh, amongst our people. And we have them in the, in the churches. Maybe you might have seen some of them. That's a very terrible, uh, a very toxic kind of attitude. Now, people with such attitudes, John is saying, I'm going to come. And when I come, we are, I'm going to mention all these attitudes, what these things they've done one by one. It might not be John coming now, but if you have someone or if you are someone who keeps this kind of a toxic attitude, the day is coming when God is going to ask you this one by one. How you destroy the church, how you destroy other people, how you supported other people to destroy other people instead of building them up. Because the Bible says we need to build each other up, not to tear down. We need to support other people, not to, not to, uh, to throw them down. We need to motivate people to keep going. When they fall, hold their hands and let them keep going. But not to push, not to smart, not to push them down, not to discourage them, not to despise them for whatever reason. And of course, there are also a group of people who are like the, the Demetrius. These are people who, who are so truthful to themselves and truthful in what they do. They are not pretenders. They are not hypocrites. When they show they love you, they love you from their hearts. When they show they love you, they mean what they say. When they, show, when they, when they say they love you, they do that by action, not just by words. So that these are some of these are a lot of things, uh, a few few of the things, very important things that, that we could see from this um, this short epistle. Love and truth are not the only key words in this epistle. Love and truth, of course, love and truth have been the the, uh, the, two, the two key words we've been talking about. But not only not only love and truth, but another word is the word witness. It is found in verse three. It expressed in the word testified. Then in verse six. We have the word report, and in verse 12, we have the word bear record and keep and record. Right away, we are impressed with the fact that this man, Gaius, Gaius, the man who, got, who helped God to walk, was a tremendous witness and testimony to love and to truth. These two great things in John's epistle. The emphasis, I believe, is that whilst John has been concentrating on a great amount of doctrinal material regarding Christology, and the doctrine concerning the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, he wants us to grasp this truth that the fight against falsehood is not fought alone by our words, but the fight against falsehood must be fought on the battleground of our lives. To others in our world, truth is not essential. Some believe and you would have them say, so long as the deeds that you do are good and you do them, that's all that matters. What John is saying here is, we live in a world where falsehood is everywhere. People promote, people love telling lies. People don't like truth because truth exposes the deeds that people are doing in secret. 
So people don't like truth. So John is saying, to fight this truth, you have to stand on the battleground of the truth. You have to be truthful yourself to be able to fight the truth. You have to stand as a model. Paul would say to Timothy that live your life in such a way that nobody will find a reason to accuse you for anything. So you want to fight this the falsehood if you see around. You want to fight, fight false teachers. Then false teaching should not be found in your mouth. So that is when you become a fellow worker of the truth. A fellow worker who understands the truth, who sits on the truth, who speaks the truth, and who is a witness of the truth. Gaius testified the truth. He was a witness of the truth, and he responded truthfully to this people. And that's why John recommended him. So, in some summary of all of this, this short epistle of, uh, of John, with this John and the other three characters, has a lot of things we need to learn from. I think like next week, I'm going to give a general summary of these three letters about first, second, and third John. Maybe I'll just mention the key, the key, to, key theological or theological themes, key topics that we find from these three short, uh, three, uh, three letters of John. So, but one thing we must take home here is we have the responsibility to be supporters of God's work and supporters of God's people who do God's work. By doing that, we are actually doing the will of God the Father. Because Jesus says, when you do this, because you know me, you are actually doing it for me. That, that's when Jesus said, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. Where did you see Jesus do that? But when you do it to these little ones, the people you see because you know God, people you see because they profess the gospel of Christ, you are actually doing it for God, for Jesus Christ. You are doing it as, as if you are doing it unto him. So there's a reward for all of this. So as, as Christians in church, as leaders in community and as community and society, we ought to be people with a kind of uh, Gaius's heart. You know, to support, to encourage, to respond, to like speak the truth. That when you speak, all lies would vanish. Just like light sends away darkness, truth should send away falsehood. And you and I are the agents of this truth. And this truth that we are talking about, we are representatives of this truth. And that is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is truth himself. So where there is falsehood, our presence should bring truth. Where there is darkness, our presence should bring light. Not only truth by what we say, but truth by what we do. Be truthful by what we do, by what we say, and how we respond to people, uh, how we respond to react to issues around us. But that is, that is when we will become fellow workers of the truth. Not just any kinds of workers, not just workers who tear down, but workers who build up. Workers who encourage, workers who motivate, workers who are so passionate about seeing that the gospel of Christ progresses, workers who are so uh, passionate to see that other people are, uh, are, are able to be witness to, like the uh, workers who, who are so passionate to see that the gospel of Christ reach other people. That is love. Because with this love, what you receive, you extend it also to other people. So these are the kind of workers whom John in the epistle described as fellow workers of the truth. There are so many ways we can be part of this. There are so many ways we can participate in this. So like I often tell you in class, you have to, you have to discern which way actually have, uh, are you, is your strength coming from, in which you... Uh, you use or you want to use or God wants you to use in uh, being part of this uh, of this great commission? Is it about sitting down to pray or to encourage or to motivate or to give your time, your energy and your result or your resources or to actually go by yourself? So these are there are so many ways we can be part we can partner with this to ensure that God's work is done, to ensure that God's work continues to ensure that we become, we lay a helping hand on each other. And when you see fellow workers, 
you support them, you encourage them, and you don't tear them down. And you don't discourage those who want to support them, just like uh, Diotrephes did. Or become the, the, uh, people like Demetrius and Gaius, who stood for the truth and became witness for the truth. So let me stop here. I don't know if um, anyone, if Osikim might just unmute all of you. And if there are going to be any quick questions from nah. anyone. Okay, unmute. Or... Okay, everybody, your side, you can unmute your voice. Yeah, everybody, you can unmute your voice. Okay, so now any, it's all right. Any quick yeah. question? Any quick question from anyone? I have the question, Pastor. Yes, please. So, so, how does this book, John, relate in this time that we are in, in this uh, pandemic time? Showing the love to people and uh, um, to be hospitable like like Gaius. So, say that again. I didn't hear the first thing you said. My question is, Pastor, how does this uh, book of John ne, relate in our time, in this pandemic time? Because I'm looking at the character of Gaius, uh, the, that good character of uh, having love and, uh, and, 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 and so hospitable. Do you get what I'm trying to yeah, say? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, what I'm, let me just tell you one way. What Gaius did, that was a show mm. of that was a show of love. Mm. Firstly, I said he opened his heart. He mm. accepted you from his heart. Then it was easy for him to open the doors of his house mm. to accommodate them. Mm. So how do you show love? What is this telling us about showing love in the times of, in the time of pandemic? There are so many. One, one practical way is you there are people who are in need of our help. Mm. Maybe someone needs food to eat, someone needs uh, just a call to support them, or you have someone lost their family, uh, their loved ones, or their family friend is infected with, with the coronavirus. Just give a call. That is, if it becomes too dangerous, because even though we are able to move around now, if it's too dangerous to actually move to go mm. see the person, just give a call. Pray for them and encourage them. And mm. there are people who are in need of support. Or they don't go. They don't go to work. There's no money now. They, they struggle to get food to eat. If you, if you are blessed to help these kind of people, no matter how little, it is, even if it's the one, you show this attitude of love from your heart and extend this love to them. That will show. That will show that yeah, you are someone who has concern for what other people are, are for what affects other people. You are a people, person who is not rejoicing when other people are crying, but you are also crying with those who are crying because you also want you want them to see, you want to see them rejoicing and happy, just like you are. So that's one practical way I can say about this. And of course, you pray if you know them, or the faithful people who you can, who, who, who you, as much as you can, and encourage as many as you can. If you can help or help. That's my answer to your question. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I add up on that? Um, yes. Yes. Ah, please. Show me your face. And yes, I think. Show me your face. You let you. Your face is. Can you hear me? Yes. I want to see you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Fundis. I think uh, on this note, um, Fundis, you can give <laughs> people some good messages, courageous messages. Uh, uh, um, 
you can tell me a message that can encourage people yeah. and give a, a, a faith that everything is going to be fine. That is yeah. it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you for that contribution. Yes, Pastor. Any other question, quickly? Well, just just to add to what you said, actually, uh, you know, a lot of people are so much uh, discouraged, mm. are so much afraid, as if the coronavirus is not a death sentence. Mm. It's not mm. a death sentence. Yes. So it's not. Even though there are people who have recovered from it, so we need to encourage and motivate other people. Even when someone oh. says this is the coronavirus, it's not the end of their life. These are times where we need to send messages, like you said, pray for them and encourage them. Talk to them. Tell them that hey, there is hope. There is hope mm. that yes. UK, a lot of people have been healed. It doesn't mean that when they are taken, they are going to die. Or that's the end of life. So, I like think it's such kind of encouragement. I'm hearing nothing right now. So, thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Yeah. So, any other thing? Uh, now we have to say, if every really will be exhausted, even this feel of the pandemic, our time will be exhausted by the name of Jesus Christ. The love that is always for us and the hospitality to give us hospitality to our brothers and sisters. And we have to keep it that further from now to go on. Okay. Hello, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, the question. Um, guy, guy has one. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. You can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's right. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. I wanted to ask uh, if Gaius was helping other members of the church with love, with deep love from the heart, ne? I'm sure with this people you was helping. Some of them we could help, but some of them they can never on the top. They won't say thank you. You can't tell. I promise we cannot hear you. network is not good. It's breaking. Okay. Let me, let, let me write it down. Okay. Pastor, you can turn around. Sorry? We can hear you. Yeah, I think yeah. we can hear. All right. Any other thing before Pom is right our question? Any other question? I just I tell you very much that I think I have um I have understood okay. I have understood uh, what you um what you said. Um of which I think for me is it's 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 something that is very challenging in our time. Um showing love because it, um, mm. most of the time one um does something um not, 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 not because um, I mean they, one would do something just to be seen doing something good for someone, and I think um, I think this is the message that then uh, we need to start uh, preaching that it's when we do things we shouldn't do it for someone. Else, but, um, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. Promise, I haven't seen your question. Oh. Okay, promise saying, as guys was helping fellow workers, I'm sure some of them went to him with some test because he might help someone, but they could just do it not wanting the help from him, but to test him. How then was he to know? All right, um, that's the question promise is asking. <coughs> okay. This is the answer to your question, Promise. Gaius here, Gaius was supporting, remember what we said last week about Second Gospel, <coughs> about these false teachers. So Gaius was in support. He, he, he loved those who were, who were uh, pre preachers of the Gospel. These are not false teachers. He loved, he showed them love. He encouraged them, he welcomed them. You understand? And he became, he was described as a man who is a spiritual man. So he helped them by welcoming I told that these preachers used to travel around. They used to travel. So when they traveled, they needed someone to welcome them into their homes. So since the uh, uh, DHFers wouldn't allow that to happen, that is to be of welcoming them into his home. It is not that they went to Gaius, but Gaius offered to do it. So what the point here is, you don't really wait for people to start coming to you for help. But when you see there is need for help, you, have, you just have to step out, go ahead and render the help. That's what Gaius did. He didn't have to wait for these people to ask him for the help, but he was willing and he determined to, to give out the help, to accommodate them, even though there were challenges, Dimitri, Dimitri, uh, Dimitri, uh, Dimitri was saying, no, nobody should do that. But guys went ahead to do that because he felt that was a good thing to do. So, of course, there, when you do things like that, there are, you find people who would come to test you, actually. <coughs> but if you have, if you have, if you have, this, uh, have this, uh, the Spirit of God in you, of course, which you have, like we have in Second, second uh, Epistle, you are able to discern those who are actually coming to just test you or yes. those who come to you for help. Because yes. anyone who is coming with an evil intention and you are having a clean mind, God exposes them in one way or the other for you to understand so you don't fall a victim of that. Mm -hmm. So people who come to you with those things, it just kind of help you to stand strong, to be discerning, to understand that what you are doing is not for them to see, not for people to see or to tell you, to praise you, but for God who sees in secret, mm. to see mm. and reward you. So you are not doing it for them, but doing it for God's sake. Mm. Right. Mm. Okay, uh, yeah, Pastor. Okay, yeah, promise I, th I hope I answered your question. So, guys, uh, I think in the absence of anything, that should be the end of this question. We have... <laughs> we cannot continue. We have to stop until nine o'clock because no, 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 no. we have a lot of questions to ask. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much.